Hello, I'm Walt Jurek. Thank you for joining us at Community On Demand. For the past few months, Pastor Dan has been teaching about the end times from the book of 2 Thessalonians. Dan has titled this Sunday's sermon, End Times Coaching, because it's as if Paul takes his readers into a halftime locker room and gives them a pep talk with some coaching about living in the end times. This message was recorded during a live Sunday morning service at Community. Let's join Dan as he begins his message. You know, October the 7th, 1916, uh, will go down in history as the worst defeat in college football history. Georgia Tech on that day beat Cumberland College of Kentucky 222 to zero. Can you believe that? The much smaller Cumberland players were being mauled. Halfway through the first um, half of the game, one of the Cumberland uh, players fumbled the ball, and it rolled over toward another of his teammates, and he yells at his teammate, pick it up, pick it up. And the teammate looked back and said, you pick it up, you dropped it. And, And that's the way the game went. Uh, it, was, it, it, it was horrible. Uh, at halftime, Coach John Heisman, who, by the way, uh, was the coach at that time for Georgia Tech and who's the, uh, the Heisman Trophy is, is named after, he gathered his team in the locker room, Georgia Tech, and, and he looked around at them and he said, Now, boys, you've done all right the, the, the first half. In fact, the first quarter... Uh, Georgia Tech led 63 to nothing. By halftime, they led 126 to nothing. So he gathers in, 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 the, um, in, in the locker room and he said, Now, boys, you've done all right, but I'm telling you, don't trust those guys out there. You don't know what's up their sleeve. We might get out there and they might pull something on us. So stay alert, stay clean. Hit them clean, hit them hard, get out there and win the game. And, of course, they did. They, they, they went out. They, they played the second half. Uh, Georgia scored 32 touchdowns, 18 field goals, while Cumberland fumbled the ball nine times and had six interceptions. Several of the Cumberland boys were taken off the field with injuries, including quarterback Edwards, who was knocked out three times and had to be carried off the field with a concussion and come back on to play. This game was so grueling that they had to, in the second half, they had to reduce the quarters from 15 minutes to 12 minutes just to get through the game. You know, sometimes I feel like the players on that Cumberland team. Sometimes it feels like We are losing so badly that I want someone else to pick up the ball and run with it. And let me just watch for a while. Sometimes when it looks like we're about to make some forward progress, I fumble the ball. Or I get tackled. And and, and I think, are we ever going to win? Is anything ever going to go right? And When I look out at you guys out there, I know that every one of you sitting here has suffered defeat in your life. I mean, it's part of living. Some of you have suffered such catastrophic defeat that you wonder if you'll ever recover. Uh, you, 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 you suffer with, with devastating wounds and, and, uh, and, and such hardships, you, you think, can, can, I, can I go on? Uh, can I make it? Uh, some of you have been severely wounded. You suffer emotional scars because of defeat. Here's the thing. We live in a world where evil seems to have the upper hand. And, and it just seems like the farther we go, the worse it gets. Satan keeps on running the score up, and it feels like we're losing a fighting battle sometimes. We try to do right, 
When we look around, we feel like we're outmanned, outgunned, and we become so mentally exhausted and emotionally defeated and spiritually emptied that we just want to quit. We just want to stop. Stop the game. Don't reduce the time. Stop the game. Let's just quit. You know, that's exactly the way those Christians felt 2,000 years ago in the church at Thessalonica. They were getting it from all sides. I mean, the Jews were persecuting them. The government was corrupt. False teachers had inundated them in the church and were teaching them that Jesus is not coming because he's already come. He came in spirit. He's here, you know. I mean, they, 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 they were struggling so much that, that, that they just felt like quitting. They had lost hope, and now they're lacking faith, and, and they're at a time when they don't know if they can continue forward. And that's when the Apostle Paul begins to close out. We've, we've gone through this, and the Apostle Paul starts closing out with a message that feels like what he's doing is gathering them in the locker room, in a huddle. And he's giving them some last words that will encourage them. They were so tired and so beat down, and he's trying to pull them back together. And, and, he's, and he's saying, okay, guys, let, let's, let's get with it. Let's suck it up. Let's get back out there and win the game. And what he does as he ends this in his closing, he infuses them with hope and restores their faith by challenging them, commanding them, and charging them to do three things that will help them buckle up and get out there and win. Let me give you those three things as we close. Number one, he challenges them to stay motivated. Look there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 13. And here's what he says to, his, to, to, the, to the team, to the church, to those that, are lose, that have lost hope, to those that are lacking faith. He says, but as for you, brethren, do not Grow weary doing good. Stay motivated. Don't give up. Don't give in. Again, they lost hope. We talked. We said that several times. Last week we saw where they were. They were losing faith, and they're so negatively impacted they, that they were beginning to lose motivation. Their, their motivation and their drive. And so he steps in and he just challenges them, don't grow weary. This word, this term, grow weary, it's in kakeo in the Greek, and it means to lose one's motivation. It, it, it means to, uh, to, uh, to not continue uh, to, to um, in, in, in your activities, to lose enthusiasm, to be discouraged. Let me declare something to you today. One of Satan's greatest weapons is this thing of discouragement. If he can defeat believers mentally in so much that they lose hope, begin to lose faith, if he can defeat these people mentally and emotionally, the rest is a piece of cake. If he can do it here, he can do it totally. So he's challenging them, don't give up, don't give in, don't get mentally weary, don't get defeated mentally. He's telling them to stay motivated, stay inspired, stay encouraged, stay enthusiastic, keep it up here. Don't get tired of this, stay motivated. Second thing he tells them is he commands them to stop mingling. Look in verse 14. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. There were people in the congregation who were counterproductive. We've talked about that several times in this series. Um, and, and, And what they were doing is they were pushing back against Paul and Timothy and Silas as they were teaching. Throughout this 
throughout this letter and throughout the letter in First Thessalonians, he is teaching them to live in, in the light of the coming of Christ and the soon coming of Christ. He was motivating them, and there were people in the congregation pushing back on that. Oh, we've heard that before. It's not going to happen. I mean, Paul is, is wrong. And, and, and they, were, they were pushing back. And what he says here uh, is he says, just don't keep company with people that can't grab hold of the vision, the vision of the gospel, and, and, um, uh, and, and move forward. There were people that troubled the people. If you look up in chapter 1, there were people that couldn't see the vision of the gospel. If you continue to read, uh, and, 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 he said, and, and there were skeptics in the crowd. So he, said, he used this word, don't, uh, he, don't keep company. This is a fascinating word, keep company, if I can say it. Are you ready for this? Synonym, <laughs> synonym makamina. That's not right. Mach not me. It's just a really long compounded Greek word. And it sounds like synonym. And here's what he's saying here. He, he's saying, don't mingle with people that are counterproductive to what the vision is here. Because what will happen is you could become a synonym of them. You can become like them. Pretty soon you can become a skeptic. Pretty soon you're discouraged. Pretty soon you're becoming counterproductive. Don't do that. And, and I, I said a moment ago, he's commanded them. He is speaking in the imperative. This is not a suggestion. He's commanding this. Uh, he, he's telling them, don't do it. Don't join in people that are counterproductive to the vision here. Number three, he charges them to start mentoring. Yet do not count him, the one that you're not supposed to mingle with, do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. He's not telling church members to, uh, to, to just exclude counterproductive people, skeptical people in the church. He's telling them to take note of them and, the, and begin to enter into a mentoring relationship with them. This word admonish is nutheo. And, and, if, and if you look it up, it means to put in the mind, put something in. It's a word that's used for counseling oftentimes. And, 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 and it's, a, it's where the, you, know, you put in heart or impart something like a warning. Hence, what he's saying is warn, counsel, mentor, disciple them. That's the word that we use today. Paul is saying, make a note. Make a note when someone is counterproductive. This person may be struggling with emotional damage or spiritual wounds. They may be defeated. They may have given up. Take a note. And then flip the relationship to whether you're putting something positive in them to begin to change them and lift them up. You know, Paul is saying, in the world that we live, evil is going to happen. People are going to be defeated, and Satan is going to try to defeat us in our mind. So what we have got to do is we can't just lay down and quit. He's telling the church that. He is saying... He's challenging them. He's saying, stay motivated. He's saying, stop mingling with counterproductive. And he says, start mentoring people around you. When it seems like we're losing, when we feel like we're defeated, when Satan keeps running up the score, we really need to huddle in that locker room and listen to Coach Paul. He... he will help us to get back in and stay, stay motivated and, and do the thing. So the question is, how can you develop that mentality? How can you not be defeated? How, how, can, you, how can you grab hold of what he is commanding and challenging us to do? Well, there's a secret to this, and Paul goes ahead and kind of addresses us as he begins showing us how that we can maintain the things that Paul is trying to give us during the days that we're, we're defeated. 
And, and he starts that down in verse number 16. He said there's actually three things that we need to be doing. Number one, we need to experience God's peace. Look at verse 16, first part. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. Like I said, we may feel like we're losing right now, especially. Are you, uh, watch me get knocked off the, the YouTube for this. Especially with crazy, insane, <laughs> keystone cop tyrants that are running the show today. <laughs> Do I get an amen? <laughs> ah, you know. Trying to control and, and, uh, and uh, but all of this is about to change. I believe with all my heart as the Lord is about to return. Uh, Rich is teaching, Pastor Dan knows when the Lord's going to return. When is it going to happen? Soon. <laughs> we can't not. I, I want to take you back to Isaiah. One of the, you know, we'll use this during the Christmas time, but I love what he says here. Jesus is going to return I mean, Isaiah predicts that he's going to return, and he's going to be running the government. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6, it says, for unto, us, for unto us, and he's predicting the birth of Christ, but he says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father, and Prince of Peace. For a thousand years, there will be this reign of peace with Christ sitting at the, at the command post and us being able to enjoy that peace. As things continue to worsen in our world, we can actually experience God's peace as we focus on the end game and stay faithful, loyal, and motivated. Coach Paul is saying it a little different when he talks to Timothy uh, in, a, a cup, uh, in, in, in first, Second Timothy. He says it like this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. How do we react? How do we draw on that peace of God? By having anxiety and fear? No. It, it's, it's, by, it's by drawing to him and, and, and understanding and receiving that power and love and sound mind. So no matter how difficult things may seem at the moment, we can experience God's peace. We can... We, we can um, do that by living in the light of his coming, staying motivated, faithful, prepping for his return. So we need to experience God's peace. Secondly, we need, we need to embrace God's presence. As Paul finishes this prayer, he says, the Lord be with you. Several times in the New Testament, Jesus promises to be with us until the end. Uh, not leave us, not forsake us. And, and, he, uh, and we know, if you've been around here uh, for, for a while, you know that he does this with the indwelling of his spirit. When we trust Christ as our Savior, immediately his Holy Spirit moves within us, and he's with us now uh, un until he returns. And, uh, and, and, and we've studied that. And what Paul is doing here, he's, he's prayerfully blessing us with the continual presence of Christ during difficult times. In fact, when difficult times come, that's when it seems you draw closer to the Lord. I've had many people say, you know, the only thing I miss about the, the crises or the difficulty that I was going through is that I was so close to the Lord. His presence was so great during that time, uh, and, 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 and I miss that. So as things get difficult, we can close our eyes and we can think this. Jesus, I know you're there. You said you'd never leave me or forsake me, so come a little closer. Pull in a little close. I need to embrace you because I'm going through a difficult time, and I can't do it by myself. And we pull in close to him in his presence. Embrace his presence. So experience his peace, embrace his presence, 
And in fact, Paul says this is so important here that he does something. He says, the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. He says, this is so important that you embrace the, the presence of God that I'm going to, hey, Luke, uh, just stop right there. Let me, let me just sign this right here. He, that's his secretary. And he, and he says, that's how important this is. I want you to see it. Embrace his peace. Third, we need to enjoy God's program. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. In, in, in Ephesians chapter 1 through 3, chapter 3, Paul inaugurates something that he calls the dispensation of grace. And, and then he says uh, that, that, he is, that he has given us the dispensation of grace and t- until the fullness of time. That, uh, that is talking about the end of the dispensation of grace, that everyone in Christ, during, at, the, at the fullness of time, that everyone in Christ will be gathered to him. So look at it this way. The Ephesians, the Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul 2,000 years ago were on the front end of this dispensation of grace, and things were a little confusing for a lot of those Christians, we're on the tail end of this dispensation of grace. And now that we've got the scriptures, things are so much clearer to us. We, we see so much better than what we did at that time. This Greek word for grace is kara or charis. And it means favor, care, help, goodwill. And what, what's happening is God extends salvation to us by his grace. And wants us to be able to get in the program, uh, get with the program of salvation by grace. Not salvation by works, but by grace. And at the end of this dispensation, he'll come and gather us to be with him. We are living, folks. You may be anxious. You may be worried. You may be wondering, what's next? We've got what's next. We know the end of the story. But we are living in the most exciting time in history. What better time to be living in when we will experience most likely the return of Christ before, I mean, it's, it seems like it's moving pretty quickly that will culminate with, uh, with, with his return as we embrace his peace, experience his presence, enjoy his program of grace by getting with the program. This past week, I read a story. It, it, was, a, it was about um, Jan Paderewski, who was a famous Polish uh, composer, pianist. And uh, he, had come, he had come to one of the great concert halls here in the United States uh, to, to, to have a, a performance in one of those real highfalutin um, concerts where all just, you know, the... the the snobbish people come to, you know, come and, and, and listen. And there was a lady there that brought her little nine-year-old boy. She was having trouble with his, with his piano lessons. And so she brought him to the concert, hoping to inspire him to, uh, to be more faithful with his piano lessons. That was her. But when she got there and saw all of the, all of the people, I mean, she was, she was all enamored and and a little boy sat to the side here they sat up close to the stage she wanted him to get she wanted him to see everything but she she noticed the people famous people to the side and and she began talking with them and carrying on the conversation what she didn't notice is the little boy was fidgeting and looking around he just got up from his seat and he walked down the aisle and walked up to the front and came up the steps on the stage and walked over to the grand, beautiful Steinway piano, and he sat down at the piano, and and people begin to gasp out there watching this scene unfold. And he sits down at the piano, and he dips his two little fingers and he starts playing chopsticks. Ding 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 ding. Yeah, and and he just he just you know he he knew chops. He's just playing chopsticks, and all of a sudden in the audience, people said. Get that boy off the stage. This is an outrage. Whose little boy is that? And I mean, it was just the cat calls were coming everywhere. Everybody was upset. And back in the, in, in the green room, 
the maestro heard the commotion, looked out on the stage, saw what was happening, threw his tuxedo coat on, ran out on the stage, put his arms on both sides of the little boy, and began uh, improv doing the counter melody to chopsticks all up and down the ivories, back and forth, and just kept in. And the whole time he's playing, he reaches down to the little boys with his, with his mouth and he says, keep playing, keep playing, keep playing. And they played the entire song. And at the end, the crowd cheered, bravo, bravo. And everyone stood and gave them a standing ovation. And the maestro came out with the little boy and bowed. Folks, we are on the stage. It's our time. The Lord's about to return. We hear the voices criticizing, saying, you stupid Christians, why, why, why do you gather during COVID? Why do you do these things? Don't you understand? And they push and push, but the word comes to us, keep playing, keep playing. Don't stop. Stay motivated. Keep playing. Let's bow our heads for prayer. On behalf of Pastor Dan and the folks at Community, thank you for joining us today at Community On Demand. Feel free to share this link with others, and please know you are always welcome to be our guest during a live service any Sunday morning at our campus in the Woodlands, Texas. For more information, just click on the link www.cbcwoodlands.org I hope you will again join us at Community On Demand.